the end of the paper. Oh, good. That's the most important issue on the agenda. Um, well, welcome to what I, I'm sure you'll all agree is a very timely um, subject, and um, we're very privileged to have an exceptionally talented speaker to open the discussion. Um, I don't need to stress to you all the number of issues that the, we face um, in the Middle East, um, including right now the, the nightmare that the, the virus will spread to far reaches of the region, including possibly Syria, maybe even Gaza, who knows. Um, I've asked Martin Indyk to open the discussion uh, on the essential subject that we build, um, ambitions and realities for U.S. policy. Um, Martin's um, uniquely qualified to talk about this. Uh, he's now, of course, a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, but <coughs> I'm not going to go through his entire resume, except to point out that between July 2013 and June 2014, he was a special envoy to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, <coughs> negotiations. Um, he served as ambassador to Israel not just once, but twice from 95 to 97, and then 2000 to 2001. He was director of the, uh, senior director for Near East uh, Affairs, um, oh, and South Asian Affairs, I see. This is before they changed the same job you had. Same job, job I had, where we had India <coughs> as well as uh, Israel, um, on the National Security Council staff and was then Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East uh, from 97 to 2000. The stellar record of writing and participation in uh, think tank community, including founding the uh, well-established um, Washington Institute for Near East Policy. So Martin's going to talk for about 20 minutes. I know there's going to be lots of questions. But we've asked uh, Tom Pickering, another <coughs> extremely distinguished uh, diplomat, who I'll say a few words about uh, after Martin's spoken, to make a few comments. And then it's going to be open season. Uh, and all I ask that you do is state your name very clearly. And <coughs> we will try to get to everybody. We do have to end probably at 1.30. That is the one constraint but I think we've got plenty of time to cover this subject. So without any further ado, Martin, it's yours. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. It's, uh, <coughs> I wish I could say it's nice to be back in Washington. So you may know I, I, I uh, migrated from here a couple of years ago to New York. Um, but it's, it is nice to be back with the national interest uh, with Jeff when I think about Jeff was probably the first uh, government official I ever met in Washington when he was at the Pentagon. He took me to lunch at the Pentagon. I was just a PhD student. Uh, and um, we've shared an abiding interest in the region uh, ever since. So thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be here. And of course, it's a great honor to have my mentor in all things policy related, uh, Tom Pickering. Yeah, uh, to have <laughs> as a respondent. Um, I'd like to begin by, since we are here at the national interest and since the topic is ambitions first reality, to talk a little bit about an argument that I put forward in, in a Saturday essay in the Wall Street Journal that some of you may have seen about a, a month ago. Um, it had a, a title that, of course, I didn't write, which was the Middle East doesn't matter anymore, <laughs> uh, which is not exactly my position, as you'll see. But uh, it did serve uh, to cause a certain amount of, of um, 
comment, uh, mostly by those who actually believe the Middle East doesn't matter anymore, who thought that I had become a defector to the isolationist crowd. And I <coughs> got offered a job at the Quincy Institute and uh, was hailed as a, as, as a defector hero. Uh, and uh, to make it more, the point more effective, they had to build me up as some great diplomat and uh, guru in order to uh, give greater weight to my argument. But since it was slightly distorted, I wanted to take the opportunity to to uh, present it in uh, with greater clarity to uh, this crowd, which is by definition um, interested in the national interest. So the first thing I want to say is that it's essential if our ambitions are to be brought into alignment with reality that that we uh, understand that our interests in the region have changed. Now the very idea that interests change is a novel one, but uh, I think it's, it's important for us to come to terms with it. Traditionally, historically, I've lectured for many years about this. Our interests essentially came down to uh, four. Uh, the, f the first three were oil, oil, and oil. <laughs> the fourth was uh, Israel. Uh, and uh, oil was really about uh, ensuring the free flow of oil at reasonable prices from the Middle East, which was the kind of reservoir for the world's oil supply uh, for the you know, longest period of time, since the Second World War, essentially. Uh, oil, in terms of uh, ensuring that we had good relations with the countries that were the oil producers and <coughs> helping to ensure their stability, and oil in terms of uh, wanting to have access to their markets and to to the money that uh, the sale of their oil generated, which was particularly useful for propping up our military industrial complex, amongst other things. Uh, Israel, uh, we had an interest in the survival, <coughs> security, and well-being of, of the Jewish and democratic state, which over time became our ally in other respects uh, as well. And so uh, those interests led during the Cold War to a uh, <coughs> policy of trying to achieve dominance uh, in the region. And that was particularly the case during the Cold War when we were competing with the Soviet <coughs> Union and the Soviet Union had uh, managed to build its support amongst the Arabs. Uh, at our expense, as a result of our uh, support for Israel uh, and the Arab-Israeli conflict that was raging in those times. And that <coughs> generated a uh, fifth interest, if you like, which I define as a derived interest. It derived from the fact that we had real interests in uh, the Arab world and Israel. But Israel and the Arabs were in conflict, and therefore we had an interest in reconciling these competing interests of ours by resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. And that was a derived interest uh, after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State, then came in to the region <clears throat> and promoted an American-led peace process as the way to not only reconcile our competing interests, but promote our dominance in the region at the expense of the Soviet Union. It's worth remembering that it was a time of retrenchment in American foreign policy as a result of the end of the Vietnam War. Paris peace accords had been uh, announced with great fanfare the year before. Uh, and uh, Henry Kissinger used 
American diplomacy rather than the deployment of American force as the way to promote our interests in the region and in particular use the, the effort to uh, resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict as a way to uh, put in place the foundations of a new American-led order in the Middle East. And that American-led order, which became to dominate the region uh, through the Cold War and afterwards, uh, became um, the way that we uh, were able to protect our interests. Well, fast forward <coughs> to today. And uh, our interests have changed uh, in, I think, fundamental ways. Whereas before we were prepared to go to war uh, to protect those interests, uh, making them essentially a vital interest in the United States, such as going to war to remove a threat to oil that was presented by Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. Um, Nowadays, uh, we are busy trying to end wars in the Middle East. And we have not just one president, but two presidents, both Trump and Obama, arguing that our interests no longer require us to uh, maintain our presence uh, in the region, military presence in the region, uh, and, uh, and, and the shift uh, therefore in priorities um, to other parts of the world, in particular to Asia, where a rising China is a much more vital interest um, and to uh, the United States uh, than the Middle East. Um, so essentially, what, what I believe we need to face up to is that in the first instance, Oil, which has driven our, our interest in the region, um, our interest in oil has changed quite dramatically. And in fact, uh, revolutionary, in a revolutionary way, I would say, uh, simply because of the shale revolution in the United States. Not the only reason, um, but the oil market has changed in such a way that not only are we a net oil exporter, but the, the nature of the market is such that um, we no longer depend on <coughs> oil from the Middle East. Um, and whereas others do, uh, and yes, whereas we continue to have an interest in seeing um, oil flow to the economies of Japan, China, India, uh, South Korea and Europe, who are dependent on Middle East oil would argue it's no longer a vital interest of the United States. Uh, in fact, the oil market has changed so dramatically um, in recent years that we can see that even the most extreme events in the Gulf, such as the attack on a upcake oil facility in Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> and the removal for a short time of some 50% of Saudi Arabia's oil production, 5.7 million barrels a day, uh, removal of that from the market barely made a difference in the price of oil, which uh, is continuing to fall in part now as a result of the coronavirus, but <clears throat> that's on top of <coughs> the overall shift in the market, which the uh, supply of oil uh, exceeds the demand and is likely to continue to do so uh, well into the future as um, electric cars, uh, climate change mitigation, uh, and uh, other uh, sources of production uh, all combine to uh, continue this kind of secular shift in the market. So, so we don't have that interest. And I know there are those who say, oh, yes, but you know, it's essential to the global economy uh, and we have to protect it. And number one, it's not essential to the global economy in the way that it used to be, as we can see from the way that, that the oil market deals with turmoil, instability in the Middle East. 
But number two, it's not, we don't need that oil for ourselves. It's China and India in particular that need that oil. And we can work with them to ensure the protection. And they should have some responsibility for protecting their uh, lines of uh, communication for that oil. Uh, it should not be the responsibility of the US taxpayer. Uh, when it comes to Israel, <coughs> I would argue that uh, over the decades of our support for Israel and our success in helping Israel to make peace between, with Egypt and, and with Jordan, uh, and uh, as a result of Israel's own uh, high-tech revolution, uh, Israel today is quite capable of standing on its own two feet and, in the words of Prime Minister Netanyahu, defending itself by itself. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't have an interest in Israel's security and well-being. We do. But its survival, I would argue, is no longer at stake. And we no longer have to contemplate uh, the kinds of actions necessary to ensure Israel's the survival and well-being that we used to. Um, on the contrary, I would say that actually Israel has a lot more to contribute to, to our interests these days than we need to contribute to, to Israel's. Um, so uh, that also, therefore, has implications for the derived interest I was talking about of an interest in resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. First of all, we have notwithstanding uh, the constant uh, statements by uh, Jared Kushner and others that, that uh, previous uh, efforts have all failed. In fact, the American-led effort to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict had some very important successes, the most important being the Israel-Egypt Peace Treaty and the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty and the Oslo Accords, and I'll be happy to come back to explain why. They were not a failure. Uh, and uh, also the Israel-Syria disengagement agreement. Um, we can come back and discuss that as well. Something you had you were involved in too, Jeff. So anyway, uh, partly because of the success of our American-led uh, diplomacy, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict doesn't have the vital importance that it once had as, as a result of uh, what I explained. Um, and in fact, we have a situation today in which the Arab states are keen to build their relationships with Israel, albeit under the table for the most part, uh, regardless of whether we resolve the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Um, it would be nice, but it's no longer a requirement. The common interest that the Sunni Arab states identify uh, with Israel when it comes to dealing with the threat from Iran is fueling this relationship much more than any successful uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, resolution uh, could, since there is no chance for an Israeli successful Israeli-Palestinian resolution anyway, it's just as well. Uh, so all of this combines with uh, a period of retrenchment in, in American foreign policy, <coughs> which uh, is driven by a sense of war weariness over the engagement in Afghanistan and in Iraq, in which the United States has invested vast treasure of, of blood and, and, and money <coughs> uh, for no good result, in fact, for some very bad results. And as a consequence, I think there's, a, there's an overall disillusionment with the idea of using force um, in the Middle East, um, which uh, may, is, I, I think, consistent with uh, the fact that our uh, interests have changed. And therefore, I believe it's essential for us to recognize this and uh, for U.S. foreign policy to be realigned in a way that our 
means, the means that we're prepared to deploy, which are much more limited these days than in the past, uh, should be fitted to objectives that need to be downgraded because of the change in our interests. And therefore, we no longer need uh, to be declaring grandiose objectives uh, for which we have no longer the means or the will uh, to apply to those objectives in order to achieve them. Uh, the most egregious one is uh, Secretary of State Pompeo's declaration that our objective in Syria is to remove every, the last Iranian boot at the very time when we are removing the last American boot from Syria. But the notion that we should engage in regime change in Iran, a quite popular notion in the Trump administration, is a perfect example of the way in which our interests do not require it, our, we do not have the means to achieve it, and uh, we should therefore skew it in favor of a containment uh, policy, uh, which would fit our interests and our objectives and the means we have to apply to it. Similarly, uh, we should not be chasing the mirage of a settlement to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That is a vital interest of Israel's, I would argue, because it's Israel that has to deal with the very real dilemma of how it <coughs> maintains its identity as a Jewish and democratic state, and yet still maintains the occupation of three million Palestinians. That's its problem. As Israel's ally and friend, we should want to help it. But it's not our problem. And that's, again, just as well, because we don't have a way of achieving it, notwithstanding grandiose plans of 181 pages. <laughs> 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 whose only uh, purpose, if it were to succeed, would be to turn Israel into the very apartheid state that the, the settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is supposed to uh, help Israel avoid. I'm happy to go into details on that. So, in essence, uh, it's not that we that the Middle East doesn't matter anymore. We still have abiding or enduring interests there, which include the well-being of our allies in the Arab world and in Israel, which include uh, a need to try to stabilize the region, uh, which include the need to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons there, and in particular to prevent therefore Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. But, as I say, uh, those interests do not require us to go to war. Uh, they do to require us to put a greater emphasis on diplomacy, as indeed Henry Kissinger did back in those earlier <laughs> days of retrenchment. Uh, but they do not require us to maintain a position of dominance in the region. <laughs> they especially do not require us to go after grandiose objectives which we no longer have the means or will uh, to achieve. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Martin. That was succinct. It was extremely provocative and interesting. And uh, I hope you all took notes. So um, let me now t turn to Tom. Um, Tom Pickering. Um, well, I don't know what else I can say about it. He's currently vice chairman of Hills and Company. But let me just tell you where he has served as ambassador to the United Nations. India, Israel, El Salvador, Russia, Nigeria, and Jordan. That is quite a record. And um, 
I think most of us know Tom from his distinguished career in the State Department. And <coughs> I've asked him, we've asked him to make a few comments on Martin's address. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you, Martin, very much for what is clearly a thought-provoking and, I think, extremely important statement on your part, both in the journal and I think even more importantly to this audience here today, which is, I think, eminently qualified to both violently agree with you and petulantly attack you in various <laughs> ways. Um, I intend to do both, but in a form that perhaps you might find different. Um, I think the presentation is a kind of sandwich. And the lower bread course is a good description of where we are. And the upper bread course in the final paragraphs of how we should go about the future is, in my view, not only welcome and perfectly acceptable, but intelligent and wise. Where I have a bit of diversion is in the meatless, vegetarian-less center filling in which you proclaim radical change but have failed in a couple of ways to notice some of the things that have influenced that change and may well have um, a what I would call salubrious and healthy effect in moving from the lower course of bread to the upper course of bread. And I didn't come prepared to have a political discussion, so I'm not going to mention the names of any American parties or leaders. But I will say that the strategy-lessness arrangements which we now have in place to move and misdirect our government are very much what I would call part of the connective non-tissue between the upper piece of the sandwich and the lower piece of the sandwich. And as a result, one cannot see these with the aura of permanence that the shift, for example, in oil has brought about. Although I would differ with you in a slight detail that it's not only China and India, but our European allies and a good bit of the rest of the world until that wonderful day when replaceable energy will replace fossil energy to a large extent, who are still dependent on the Middle East as part of the big pumping engine of essentially petroleum hydrocarbon. Uh, and so I think that piece is there. I think that it is extremely interesting that a number of the questions that you raised about why we, in fact, don't have a leadership role and why, in effect, uh, we have seemingly a strategy that takes us to, if not abandonment, recalculation of our interests in the region, uh, tend to stem from what is an inability to reconcile a lot of the pieces of the intervening set of ideas. And I won't go into those in extensive detail, but I do think, for example, uh, that the proposal to produce the deal of the century, maybe the deal of the millennium, falling flat on its face is a good reason for us temporarily to eschew the notion that we are in a world leadership position in the Middle East and that we have the capacity to produce the outcome. What worries me a little is still what I call the hoary proposition that while peace cannot mean any more to the two party to us than it does to the two parties, the two parties have the innate incapacity almost genetic, almost DNA driven, to take it beyond that and therefore some outside group, coalition or otherwise, can help. And that it is not a sense of permanent, put it this way, celerity, that we will in effect walk away from where we are now and say it's all in your hands, 
we have seen for the last four years, and maybe more, and you were perhaps a victim of this, how that kind of an approach to the Middle East is in fact the generator of more conflict. And if you believe that two decades ago, the three-eyed were countries were the principal problems and you were immediately and deeply involved in formulating policy, the notion the alphabet soup of conflict in the Middle East is now certainly not a better position for the world community, nor is it make a likely shift to Asia with which I agree is important, easier, or more helpful for the U.S. to undertake. We have also got ourselves in the awful position that having engaged in 18 and 19 year wars, there is a consequence of getting out. It's not so much, in my view, a consequence of strategy or vital interest as it is a consequence of results. <laughs> and some of those are hard to look at. Um, but if I had to bet, I would put my money on the side that our best interest is to find a way to get out. And we may be seeing in Afghanistan the first stage of that. And the first stage of that might resemble more Vietnam than it does Egyptian-Israeli peace, if I can be brutally frank. And that is not, I think, necessarily a happy outcome. Um, I think that those two or three points, I, I think, stick with me. Uh, just a reaffirmation of the top piece of bread. Here, I think we have exhausted the possibilities of military force. And that is the important argument, because in fact, total victory walking down the Champs-Élysées or Fifth Avenue or striding the deck of the Abraham Lincoln has produced a null result. Uh, because in effect, it doesn't help shape the political outcome with which all wars terminate. And therefore, the notion that diplomacy of some kind has to be introduced to work this, otherwise, the combat victory of the big fight is left to the continued conflict of asymmetry. And there is no way out. So that is, I think, an important conclusion. And I would put that in, and I thank you for this construct you've given. We have some differences on the, on the lack of meat and vegetarian bulk in the sandwich, but we totally agree on the top and bottom pieces of bread. Well, that's, that's really good to know. <laughs> well, thank you both very, very much. And so now, um, uh, and I'll give you back the microphone to defend yourself. <laughs> I'll have a question later, but not right away. I'll, so now I will entertain comments from the floor, and let me repeat, please state your name and affiliation and speak loudly. Um, a microphone will come to you, is that right? Matt, a microphone will come to you, so wait for the microphone. And um, so, f okay, uh, let me just take it. Yes, you. So, first, Dov Zakharin. We could take you short way around. <laughs> You're all right with it. Sure. In the bar and jazz. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Vice Chairman here. Um, Martin, I tend to agree with everything you say and pretty much with everything Tom just said. But I've got some questions. First, <clears throat> it wasn't clear to me whether we should pull all our troops out. Um, Afghanistan, we're going to leave 8,600. First stage. First stage. And we're going to have to leave some or else the kind of terrorist camps that I saw when I was in Afghanistan will simply emerge again. So where are you on that? Secondly, I, I, I'd like to pick up a little bit on what uh, Tom just said. Could you talk a little more about how you would integrate force with diplomacy? I mean, that's what our biggest problem, frankly. We talk about all of government, and actually we have none of government, except the military guys. And I was in the Pentagon when basically my boss Rumsfeld concluded there was nobody else who could help him out, and therefore he had to go off on his own. Um, 
so how would we deal with that? Then I'd like you to talk a little bit about when you create a dual containment, now you don't have to contain two countries, you only have to contain one, but I remember chatting with Madeline when you guys did Desert Fox, and I said to her, well, what happens if Saddam tries something again? She says, well, we'll just bomb him again. Um, that didn't seem like a terribly satisfactory answer. Um, so how would you actually play out containment? Would that be without some kind of military presence? And, and finally, on Israel, um, my views are pretty well known. I don't think they need any of our aid. How would you use finances if you use them? So first of all, do you believe we should keep throwing money at them? And if you do believe that, how would we use them in a, in, in a more leveraged way than we do today? Okay, that's quite a plateful, so uh, pick and choose, gentlemen. Okay, so um, let me take the opportunity to respond um, to Tom's uh, very uh, wise and incisive uh, remarks. Um, you know, again, I, I didn't uh, mean to say on the question of oil that uh, we have no interest there. We do. Uh, and um, yes, uh, Europe should be included in the list of countries that have interest. But here, and this gets a little bit to what, what Dom was asking about, here's where dipl our diplomacy uh, comes in. Uh, but, but it is very much um, a willingness to view this problem as a shared problem, not as our problem. We've, we have always viewed it as our problem. It's the, actually their problem. But we can lead the Europeans, Japanese, Chinese into a collective effort to ensure the free flow of oil from that part of the world. Um, and, and it shouldn't be beyond uh, diplomatic uh, skills to be able to concert that kind of uh, effort. Um, we've never asked them because we somehow thought that it was going to be detrimental to our interests to have the Chinese uh, patrolling the Gulf along with American uh, ships, but, you know, it sounds heretical, but why not? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I actually feel like the meat in, the, in your sandwich, uh, Tom, as you were go going on, but um, I think your point about uh, the consequence of getting out, and again, comes to, to Dolph's point, are uh, things that we do have to take into consideration in, in a serious way. Uh, the, you know, Afghanistan is going to look like Vietnam, but I think that the judgment that Zal at least made was as long as we can keep the terrorists out of there, which I think is still a dubious proposition, but, but that's where our interests lie, which is really, I think, uh, the key. and. and uh, it, it may require a continued presence, um, you know, it, just as I think there's an argument for a continued presence in Iraq and a continued presence in Syria. Uh, but it goes to the question of force and diplomacy. Is using that con continued military presence and uh, our air power where necessary to back up a diplomatic effort? We completely walked away from the diplomatic effort in Syria. We've left it to the Russians, the Iranians, and the Turks. And yet, you know, up until we decided to abandon the Kurds, we controlled one third of the country. Um, and we certainly basically had a veto over whether there was going to be any reconstruction aid going in. So we had a good deal of leverage uh, in Syria that we could have used to work with the other external powers that have an interest there. Um, and um, so, so I think I think that um, it's it's not a question of a, of a full scale withdrawal and turning our backs on the region by any means. We still have considerable military capacity, basing arrangements, which we I think we should adjust. But nevertheless, um, there's plenty of plenty of room there for maintaining a. Uh, capacity to back up our diplomacy uh, with the, the threat or ultimately even the use of force. But it does mean that our diplomacy needs to be in the lead, not our use of force. 
And that requires an adjustment in our mindset to downgrade the, uh, the objectives and, and in a way that brings them into alignment with the means that we have to deploy to achieve them. That, that's the heart of what, I, what I'm saying here. <coughs> um, now, in terms of specific questions, uh, how does the uh, containment of Iran play itself out? Well, look, here again, if we eschew the idea that what we're trying to do is change the regime, a policy which I don't think the president actually supports, um, but there, there seems to be a very clear view on the part of the Secretary of State and others that this should be our, our objective and that's what they seem to be trying to achieve. So, if, if, if what we're interested in is containment, we have a huge amount of leverage in the sanctions that we now have on Iran and, and it wouldn't take a lot um, to signal to the Iranians uh, that if they come to the table we're prepared to ease the sanctions and ultimately to lift the sanctions if, if uh, our requirements are satisfied. But at the same time, we should also redefine our requirements. I mean, Pompeo's list of 12 requirements is, is uh, something <coughs> that, that there's no way that the Iranians can accept uh, unless they actually want to just basically give up and resign in the regime. So, uh, but that's, that is, I think, the key, is to get them to the table and we have the means to do it. They, they I believe, want to come to the table, but they need um, a certain uh, signal from us, meaningful signal, that sanctions are on the table as well. And uh, this is the time to do that. Now, as far as Israel is concerned, first of all, I think it's very important to recognize that Israel gets no economic assistance, you know that very well, but it's not generally recognized. There's no <coughs> more economic assistance, and nor should there be. Israel doesn't need it. <coughs> uh, and Israel was benefiting from, from uh, loan guarantees, which uh, helped to reduce the interest rate uh, that it could get in the market because the United States was backing, backing them up. Uh, we reduced those loan guarantees by the amount that Israel was uh, spending on settlement activity. When I say we, I mean the US government. It was a bipartisan <laughs> policy. Um, such that when I became the special envoy and I inquired as to how, how, many, how much money was left in the loan guarantees, uh, I was told that it's all been used up <laughs> by settlement activity, which we deducted for. So, uh, in fact, there were no loan guarantees left, and Israel didn't need them anyway, given that the, its economy is, is doing so well. So that leads military assistance. If you're going to use military assistance as leverage, you immediately uh, touch on the, the nerve that you're undermining Israel's security. And uh, that's a, you know, politically a very, a very difficult uh, thing to sustain. Uh, I, uh, you know, I hark back to Kissinger because I'm just finishing a book on Kissinger's Middle East diplomacy. Uh, few people would know or uh, would remember that Henry Kissinger held up Israel's arms supplies for four months. Yeah, nearly killed him. Nearly. Well, he also tried to prevent armed shipments and nearly killed no, them. No, 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 I'm not talking about the 73 war. I know, I know. That's a, I know. Uh, he did not hold up the arms but supply during the 73 But during the reassessment, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the Israel's uh, efforts to purchase um, uh, F-15s and, and uh, Lance missiles, a whole range of other things, were stopped dead in its tracks for four months. And um, that actually proved to be uh, quite effective leverage on Shimon Peres, the great hawk in those days, who uh, was defense minister. 
and began to feel the heat of not being able to get those military supplies. Um, that did not affect Israel's ability to defend itself at that time. It actually was very well stocked with military equipment, but it did affect its long-range plan, and, and that had an influence. Now, I'm not advocating that uh, today, but I'm just using it as an example that there is a way to um, uh, indicate where Israel is acting against our interests that there is a price to be paid. Martin, let me just... Hey, I've been in charge of a reasonably large budget, so I know how money moves. <clears throat> Leaving aside the fact that the Israel of today is not the Israel of the 70s economically, <clears throat> the fact is that every dollar we give to their defense budget is a dollar they don't have to spend. And therefore, every dollar you don't give them for their defense budget, they're going to spend it on defense anyway they'll probably spend it less on something else. Now, if it's Mr. Netanyahu, it probably will be education for Arab kids. <laughs> but the fact is that it could also be money for the settlements. And so th it's a very different situation when you're dealing with a country with a GDP per capita that's greater than Japan's. Yeah, fair enough. I'm not, not saying it can't be done. I'm saying that it's complicated. Tom, did you have anything you wanted to add? I think this, I'm going to let Martin answer all the questions. Okay. <laughs> so the next person on the list, uh, you know, whoever you have intervened, that was only uh, blurbed, is Amitai Etsiomi. So you don't have to state who you are. <laughs> uh, let, let me seriously say, I accept everything you're saying. Uh, for the premise for my question, except one word. I wish you could have avoided, avoided what our apartheid, I think. Everything you could have said would have stood quite nicely without throwing this thing in there. Uh, I predict that uh, over the next years, there are going to be a radical change the way we looked at the past wars in the Middle East, that if we discovered to our surprise that we won the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, easily in three weeks and the suffering all went into nation building. <coughs> so, so the conclusion would be if we ever have to go to the war in the Middle East again, if we're not engaged in nation building and we're not looking for regime change, but looking for military victory, we can do it again in three weeks. So I think that's an important conclusion to my, by coming to my question. So, uh, uh, what I'm missing in your talk is the next chapter. So, we, let's talk about the next five years. 100 million young Arabs from Libya to Afghanistan educated without jobs. I think it's not a radical assumption to assume that 5% of them will be radicalized, which gives us 5 million terrorists. Now, has to Iran willing to give up its nuclear weapons on the promise that we're going to lift the sanctions? Let me remind you of the scene where the president was sitting at the United Nations waiting for a phone call from Iran, and when it didn't came, he offered to lift all sanctions for a phone, for a photo opportunity. So I don't see that Iran who considers nuclear weapons essential for its defense looking the way we treat with respect to North Korea and trying to push them out, that they would give up of nuclear weapons unless diplomacy is ba backed up as military force. Of oh, course, diplomacy. So, last, leaving a few thousand troops here and there in the Middle East will not stop the terrorism. So tell us about the next chapter of your story, please. Next chapter? Uh, so first of all, I want to just uh, uh, relate to the, to the point about apartheid. I've never used uh, apartheid to describe uh, Israel's policies, ever. I use apartheid today to describe the consequences of the Trump plan were it ever to be implemented. Because the consequences of the Trump plan is to create a Bantustan inside Israel. Uh, and that's what I'm saying, to achieve the very opposite of what an Israeli-Palestinian 
uh, peace uh, settlement is supposed to achieve. That's what I think is, is, is it's not just that the plan is folly, it's, it's very dangerous to Israel's future. Yeah. Uh, so the next five years, uh, first of all, I mean, yes, yes, you're, you're right. Youth unemployment in the Middle East is a huge problem. It's not a problem that we can fix. And part of what I'm trying to say is we should take it on our shoulders and assume that we have to fix it. I understand, you know, the connection of the dots between youth unemployment and lack of opportunity in the Middle East and terrorism that may come to affect our homeland. I get that. But there are other ways that we've developed now to deal with that problem. Uh, and for sure, we should be trying to help our friends in the region with their problems. Uh, but we should not take it on our shoulders to assume that it's our responsibility um, uh, or that our interests require it to be our responsibility because we can protect the, the interests that we have in other ways. That's, that's essentially my argument. So the next five years is one in which we, first of all, we adjust to the fact that we're not the dominant, we don't need to be the dominant power in the region. We don't need to be the arbiter of what happens in the region. Uh, and then if we, if we accept that, and well, there's a lot of things that we can do uh, by working with countries in the region. You know, I argue uh, that, that Israel and Saudi Arabia are uh, capable powers that can help us protect our interests. Uh, and we can work with them and uh, other like-minded countries to help to protect our interests. Uh, but not to subcontract to them and give them blank checks for behavior that actually is detrimental to our interests. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a, it, it obviously is an approach in which diplomacy, as I said, takes the lead. It is backed by the potential use of force, if necessary. And as opposed to everything else I've said, I do consider preventing nuclear proliferation in the Middle East as a vital interest of the United States and one that we should be prepared to go to war for. And when it comes to Iran, you know, I, I have a little bit of a different version of, of the history than the one that you described. Um, but uh, it's not clear to me that Iran, uh, which doesn't have nuclear weapons, uh, would not be prepared to continue the kind of controls that it accepted on its nuclear weapons program. Uh, and extend the sunset clauses and so on in exchange for uh, the lifting of sanctions, which are crippling its economy and, and choking the country. Um, and, and so that's why I, say I do think they have uh, an interest, and they've made it clear they're willing to go back to the you know, limits placed on, on Iran's nuclear program in the JCPOA, which were generally acknowledged, in particular by the Israel National Security Establishment, as uh, being quite effective in ensuring that is, Iran did not acquire nuclear weapons. The problem was that it came to an end after 10 years or so. And that is something that can be addressed in negotiations, and I believe that we could uh, achieve our objectives there of, of preventing Iran from getting nuclear weapons uh, in the process. Okay, next is uh, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. Martin, always good to see you. Um, you've addressed the Iran nuclear issue pretty well, but um, what are your what is your bottom line in terms of containing Iran's regional influence as the the author of dual containment? Since you came up with that, Iran is now. <coughs> involved not just in Lebanon, but in Iraq and Syria and Yemen and Afghanistan. So what would be your bottom line, and how would you try to achieve that with a much lighter U.S. military footprint? Thanks. Uh, 
just want to uh, make one point here. Uh, I was the author of the title of our policy, but not our policy. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Jill Katayma was my branding, but uh, it was it was the policy of the Clinton administration, not my policy, as uh, such. Um, so uh, I do believe that Iran's uh, regional activities are, are subversive and destabilizing, and uh, in in many cases highly problematic. It, it's really a case-by-case -case, uh, approach. Um, in Yemen, we should be, again, following the principle that I've espoused, uh, and Tom has uh, espoused, is that uh, in Yemen, we should be helping Saudi Arabia get out of Yemen. Uh, that conflict in itself is doing more to advance uh, Iran's uh, influence in the region uh, than, than any objective we can achieve by continuing the war. Uh, it's high cost, no gain for Saudi Arabia, low cost, high gain for Iran. It doesn't make any sense. And if that requires, in the end, a unilateral ending of the war by Saudi Arabia, so be it. And Israel can help advise it on how to uh, how to do that. I'm talking about Israel's withdrawal from Lebanon. Um, so uh, there, there, that that is, I think, the most important thing we can do when it comes to Yemen is help Saudi Arabia uh, end its involvement uh, there. Uh, in Syria, it of course is much more complicated, but we should give up on the idea that we are somehow going to roll back Iran and, and uh, somehow convince uh, Russia to force it out of uh, Syria. Um, that is simply not going to happen. The Russians are not going to cooperate. It's not in their interest to do so. And um, we don't have the means to achieve that objective. Uh, but we do have, have an ability, if we were prepared uh, to use it, to affect the outcome in Syria, to affect the political outcome that Tom refers to as the end of the conflict. And that's where we should be focusing uh, our efforts. And in the process, I believe that, you know, this is a long way off, but if, if um, we could end the conflict in Syria and stabilize the situation there, I believe in the longer term, uh, the uh, situation would evolve such that eventually a Syrian government would want the Iranians to leave. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a long way off if it, if it will ever come about. In the meantime, we have to be concerned about the way in which the conflict that is continuing on a daily basis there between Israel and Iran is actually deepening Iran's involvement uh, and not succeeding uh, in preventing Iran from creating a problem uh, for Israel on its uh, Golan border or the, the shipping uh, uh, missiles, more accurate missiles, to uh, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. And that's, a, that's a complicated problem too, but Israel suffers there from our lack of engagement in trying to help it deal with this problem. Were we an active interlocutor with Israel and Russia, uh, I believe that we could have more effect there. So I could, I could go on, we could talk about other areas as well. But, but I think the, the point is, case by case, we still have an ability to influence the situation in a way that can reduce Iran's troublemaking activities uh, and help to stabilize uh, the these countries and therefore the region. Thank you very much. This, um, no, no, no.
Thank you, Ambassador Endek, for your wonderful talk and the comments from our other ambassador. But um, I'm Anne Speckard, and I'm listed as the Joint Chief of Staff, Chairman Joint Chief of Staff, but I'm not. <laughs> I don't know how I got that promotion. <laughs> I'm the director of a small think tank, uh, International Center for the Study of Violent Extremism. And in that capacity, I've been going in and out of uh, SDF controlled Syria for the last year and a half, almost every other month. And I agree with you about the oil and about our diminishing interests. But when I, I go to interview in ISIS guys, so I've interviewed about 239 of them. And you know SDF has 16,000 prisoners. And in the recent Turkish invasion where we had such a small troop presence, but we control the third of Syria, or help to control the third of Syria, back the SDF on it. Um, it's a global terrorism phenomenon. 40,000 people went to Syria and Iraq. Um, almost all the capitals in Europe have been attacked. New York's been attacked, Orlando's been attacked. And when Turkey went in on this, in my view, a failure of diplomacy, and pulling our small troop presence out, I, I'm wondering, from your vantage point, do you see any possibility of a reversal of that? Uh, because ISIS guys tell me, the ones that come from, came from Europe, I couldn't stand watching what was happening in Syria, so I went to defend the poor Syrians, or I thought this was going to be a good and glorious caliphate. And those two things are still very much in existence. You mean the desire to, the, the motivation is in existence? Well, Caliphate's not in existence, but you say the motivation the, the virtual one is. They're still on the internet, and they still have thousands of members uh, throughout Syria and Iraq. And there's all these prisoners. And SDF was controlling them nicely. When Turkey attacked, they attacked five of the prisons. Two, two prisoners that I talked to escaped from Ainisa, um, you know, a month later. It was bizarre. And Turkey had the coordinates of these prisons and attacked them. It's not true, I'm sorry. Well, that's what uh, our military told me last week. Yeah, they're lying. Okay. Our military is lying. Okay, I guess you. I am the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, you just highlight uh, in, in, a graphic, in a graphic way uh, the problem that exists there. Uh, for sure, we can. Uh, make some a difference there, but a reversal of policy uh, is uh, simply not going to come about unless Donald Trump loses the election. And even then, it's not clear to me that a, that a, a Democratic president would want to uh, get involved in, in, in this problem, even though you can make the argument, I think this fits with what Amitai was saying, that this it's much clearer that this will come back to bite us if we don't find a way to do something about it. But again, there's plenty, there's, there's plenty of other nations, particularly Europeans, uh, but others as well that share a common interest in, in trying to deal with this problem. And again, if we took the lead and concerted the effort, I, I do think we could make a difference. And it doesn't require us to kind of go back in and control Syria. Okay. Uh, Andrew Steinfeld, retired Foreign Service officer, one of Martin's many aging acolytes in Washington. <laughs> Martin, I have a question. Um, I'd like to bring you to November this year in the United States. Um, there's an outside chance, a good chance, choose your adjective, that a Democrat will re-inhabit the White House. Bernie or Biden, I guess, are the top two choices. I think we've all been struck by Bernie's incredible public vitriol against both Saudi Arabia and Israel, at least their current leadership. Biden has been, I think, a bit silent on Israel, but very tough on him. Yes. And I'm wondering if you could assess the level of nervousness in Abu Dhabi, Riyadh, and Jerusalem of the return of any Democrat to the White House. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't been out there lately, but uh, I can imagine that they are extremely uh, concerned about it. Um, the problem that MBS faces is not just with Democrats. It's it's with the Congress, and it's it's bipartisan. There, it's, the Republicans have a, have a problem too. Uh, and and um, 
I think that that it's it's important. I do think they understand it. I think it's important that they understand it. That it's uh, it's not just a question of who's in the White House. Um, that that you know what's happened. First of all, the Saudis were not in good odor before uh, MBS came along, and certainly the murder of Khashoggi has, has just ramped it up. But the war in Yemen is the thing that I think is has got Congress. Uh, uh, really worked up because, of course, we are we are involved in that, and so it's another reason why ending the war in Yemen would be advisable for the Saudis if they want to try to improve their situation in in Washington. I think that if um, Bernie Sanders were to become president, I find it hard to imagine, but if he were to become president, what you said about Trump. Um, and it would entirely depend on who wins the Israeli elections, which are going to take place next week. And we've seen this before. Um, if Guts uh, were to win, which now looks um, questionable as opposed to a week ago, uh, Bibi is now surging in the polls. Surging in Israel means going up one or two seats <laughs> in the polls. But, but that's what make, would make a difference. Um, so it's it's unclear now exactly what will happen. But if if Benny Gantz is, is prime minister and leads a, a, a either a centre left coalition or a national unity coalition, the relationship towards the Palestinians will be different. Um, it'll be based on respect, not hatred. And and I I do think that. Um, It'll be possible to you know, find a way to to work together. Uh, if it's Netanyahu uh, leading a right-wing annexationist government that has, in the meantime, um, according to the Trump plan, annexed 30% of the West Bank, including all of the Jordan Valley and all of the settlements, then um, you know it's going to become it's going to be a, I think. A, a nasty confrontation, um, and uh, you know, if you follow my broader argument, it's a, it, it, it's a confrontation that um, doesn't serve our interests. Actually, we don't need to have a confrontation. We actually need to work with Israel on a lot of other regional problems. But I think it will be uh, inevitable um, because of, of what would will be the legacy of the of the Trump plan. And um, I, I don't have a good um, sense of how that, in the end, will sort itself out. Um, but, but I think it will end badly for both countries, for both the United States and Israel. Okay, we've got to, we're running short on time now, so there's three people that I've got on the list, and we'll get to you all, Jim, then one, two. So Jim Pope is next. Actually, Martin has just covered the, the basis of, of my question, uh, so I'll yield. Well, thank you very much, wow. Jim. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the gentleman next to Marvin up there at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador, in the, you wrote lately. Could you say who you are? Oh, yeah. My name is Victor Sharoub uh, for the Daily News Al Jadid. You wrote lately, it is time to end the farce of putting forward a US peace planes only to have both sides rejected. Are you suggesting that it is time to put something on the table which would be workable and make it work? Uh -huh. The late Zbigniew Brzezinski used to say, Israel is too strong, too divided. The Palestinian, too weak, too divided. The negotiation between, between them will never uh, end up to any uh, result. So it's up to the United States to put something workable and make it work. I don't know if you did mean that or if you prescribe to this theory. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No, I don't mean that. I don't. I do not. I, I put 
uh, United States uh, coming forward with a plan and imposing it on the two parties as part of that grandiosity that we need to get rid of. Um, we don't have the ability to impose a, a settlement on on the Palestinians or on Israel. Um, and and uh, even if we did, it wouldn't work. Um, you know, I came to the conclusion uh, the in the middle of 2015 when um, the effort that I was engaged in with, with uh, Secretary of State John Kerry came to an inglorious end, uh, that uh, the two sides were actually further apart when we finished than when we started. <laughs> And you can blame that on a failure of our diplomacy, but I rather think it was a more of a commentary on just how dysfunctional this whole uh, conflict has become. And therefore, um, uh, you know, again, if Guns were to become Prime Minister, you could work with Abu Mazen, who is desperate to find a way to bypass the Trump plan. Uh, and would run into uh, Benny Gantz's arms if he had the opportunity. Uh, it is possible to, to work with them uh, to find, our, find a way forward, but it's not a way forward that can resolve all of the final status oh. issues through a plan. It, it would require a good deal of effort to try to find steps that both sides can take to rebuild trust and confidence in the intentions of the other. There was one thing above all that I discovered in what after all were the last final status negotiations, uh, and the last one I think we will see for a long time, is that the distrust amongst the leaders and amongst the people in the intentions of the other side was, was what made it impossible to move forward. And you've got to treat that problem, but you can't do it unless you've got leaders who want to work with you. And, and that's uh, what I think needs to be done, not putting forward another uh, plan. And certainly not a plan like the Trump plan, which decides all of the final status issues in Israel's favor, period either defines them away or simply takes Israel's side. Uh, that is an imposed, I mean, what they intend is to impose this solution on the Palestinians. Um, and the best evidence of that is the U.S.-Israel Commission, what I call the Sykes-Picot Commission, <laughs> that is at this very moment drawing drawing the borders of the Palestinian state between the United States and Israel. There's not even the hint of an idea that the Palestinians might have a say in this matter. And once they've drawn the borders, according to the Trump plan, Israel gets to annex all the territory that the, the Sykes-Picot Commission has decided should be Israel's. And, 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 you know, that's not a peace process. That's, a, that's an imposed settlement. And uh, uh, not only won't it be acceptable to the Palestinians, but I believe in time it will be a disaster for Israel. Yes, last question. Thank you. 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 Dr. from Turkish Embassy. First to cl clarify, uh, Ms. Speckhard's uh, comments on, on prisons. We didn't take over five prisons or whatever. There was one. I didn't in say the take over. I said, yeah, with, um, We didn't. Uh, there was one a facility where the families were held and STF let them go. Uh, secondly, of course, 30% of Syria was controlled by STF, but STF was not opposition. STF is PKK, basically, a uh, regime ally. That's why they kindly invited regime and the Russians in when they needed. Uh, and now we see Russians bombing hospitals and people in Idlib, and the 80-plus country coalition is 
not really doesn't feel relevant about it. So basically we have Russia now deciding things, shaping things in Syria. So how do you see this picture uh, regarding U.S. Uh, uh, influence in the region and the future? Thank you. Um, so just a historical footnote again, because I, my head is uh, back in the 1970s these days. Um, like Bernie? <laughs> he was not in 60s. I got 10 years <laughs> um, and Tom will correct me if I, if I get this wrong, but I believe that uh, in those days when Henry Kissinger was busy trying to uh, lay the foundations for an American-led order in the Middle East, he did not regard Syria as critical to this effort. Uh, Syria was then uh, very much in the Soviet orbit, not that Assad wanted to be there, um, but uh, Henry wasn't particularly interested in, in doing what he was doing with Egypt, which was to take uh, Egypt out of the Soviet pocket and put it in the American pocket. Uh, and that was a kind of hard, realist, strategic calculation about where Syria fit. In the, in the broad, or the great game of uh, geopolitics in the region. And, you know, fast forward to uh, Barack Obama, who said, you know, when the Russians went into Syria, he said something like, uh, you know, welcome. they're welcome. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll get stuck there. Um, you know, it, that, that I think is worth bearing in mind. For Turkey, it's a vital interest because it's on your borders and it's obviously causing a good deal of instability uh, within your country, not just on, on the borders. So, uh, but that's not the United States. Now, um, you know, Turkey is an ally, a complicated and difficult ally at times, if you'll allow me to say. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a NATO ally. And, and you know, that's another reason why we should be active in trying to help this situation. But to do it, you know, with a certain understanding that our, you know, our vital interests are not engaged in Syria. We should be concerned about the humanitarian plight of these millions of, of Syrians. We should be doing something about that. But, but. Um, we do not need, our interests do not require us to uh, either force the Iranians out of Syria or force the Russians out of Syria. Just one brief comment on Syria in the 70s. I think Kissinger was very much preoccupied with pick one pocket at a time. <laughs> and the Egyptian pocket was so much more important. But you remember, Barton, and you must be aware of this, the blood he sweated 30 days working with Hafez al-Assad to get the condition precedent to do the pocket picking. So he was prepared, at least, uh, to recognize that. And I would say the message of that was that it wouldn't be over until Syria was somehow dealt with. He knew that. But it was not the first priority, but it was not the last. The last is still hanging on with the Palestinians. <coughs> Right. Well, that's, I mean, I, I, the only way I can top that is to say when Secretary Hay, who I was working with, made his first trip to the Middle East in April of 1981, he skipped Syria, not because he had strategic thoughts, it's because he had a meeting in London he wanted to get to. And ignoring Syria on that trip set the whole tone for the bad relations we had right the way through the Reagan administration. Yeah. Look, I'm not so, suggesting we should ignore Syria. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I want to know. Well, look, th thank you, thank you both, thank you, Martin, so much, and, 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 and Tom. This was extremely enlightening, and I think uh, at the beginning of a new reappraisal of our interests there with, I think, some very far-reaching consequences. So thank you so much for coming, and um, all the best. Thank you.